I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Garvey from Health and Wellness Services to introduce our speaker. Happy Wednesday morning, everybody. I'm Nurse KB, and I'd like to introduce our speaker this morning. This is Dr. Jonathan Baer. He's a local allergist. His office is in Northampton. He's got another office in Springfield. He can tell us a little bit more about himself, and he's here to talk to us this morning about food allergies. And this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Bayek. I'm an allergist and immunologist and a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine and a few other medical schools. I uh, do a lot of food allergy in practice, do a lot of teaching about it, a lot of research on it. I was asked to come here to talk to you guys a little bit about food allergy and what it is and how it may affect you and, and also to answer any questions that you may have. I guess there's been some incidents here on campus and um, take five or ten minutes at the end to answer any specific questions that you have. So food allergy, for those who don't understand what it is, it's when you have an allergic antibody, which you, we, about 30 percent of people in the U.S. have allergies of one type or another. An allergy can be sort of the hay fever type of stuff that a lot of us experience. It can be asthma related. It can be eczema, which is a skin condition that's allergic often. Or it can be food allergy, where you have an antibody towards a food. And the most common ones that we see in this country, and this is the most, uh, this is the country that has the highest incidence of food allergy because of the way that we, we live and how clean we develop as far as antibiotics and exposure to microbes. And that's a, a conversation that is a lot longer than we have time for today. But the most common ones are milk, eggs, wheat, soy, peanut, and then shellfish and fish and tree, and tree nuts. There are others. I've seen people with allergies to arugula and watermelon and all kinds of weird stuff, but those are the ones that are, are, are most common. And what happens is, is that you're, you develop an allergy. You're not born with food allergy, typically. Uh, you can be exposed through your mom, and you can become allergic as an infant, but most people develop food allergy as they get older. Uh, littler kids, three, four, five, or even, even your age group, and adults too. And, what, and w the way that works is that your immune system, through a mistake, creates this antibody. It's called antibody E or IgE. Ig means antibody in uh, med speak. And then when you get exposed to the food, you can have a reaction. And the reaction can be mild, um, just a little bit of itching, or it can be s severe and, and can cause death. And to, and to put the death thing in perspective, um, be, keep this in mind. There, there's between 5 and 8% of people in the United States with food allergy. Let's use 5%. There's about 300 million people in the United States. And if you do 5%, that's, uh, I'll do the math, I think that's 15 million people. And there's around 150 to 200 deaths per year. So if you, put, if you put that number into perspective, you're talking about 0 .00000, keep going, you've got a calculator, you can figure it out. But it's really uncommon to die from food allergy. And I, I say that to put it into perspective. However, it's a bad day to have a reaction, have to go to the emergency department and deal with all that stuff. And you can die from it, just like you can die from stepping out in the street without looking. Um, so I don't want people to be overly concerned about it, but there's a way that you can deal with it safely, just like if you're gonna go on a, a ship, you're gonna have a life jacket, if you're on a cruise liner, you might not need to wear it all the time, but you definitely want to have one there. So that's your EpiPen. You know, if you're, if you're somebody or if you're with food allergy or if you're around someone with food allergy, you want to make sure that you have an EpiPen, know how to use it. That's pretty easy to use. Uh, there's actually instructions on the side of an EpiPen if you don't know how to use it. I'm sure that there's been some training you know, or there will be some training if you're, if you're someone with food allergy. And then when you're in the dining hall, just be real careful if you're somebody who has a, a serious food allergy or any food allergy that you, you ask what you're, what you're getting served that you look at ingredients if, if, they're, if they're listed. If you guys are using buffet type of stuff, be real careful to not mix things around because that's a real common way for people to have reactions, especially in Chinese food restaurants or buffet type settings where there's gonna be shellfish or nuts mixed in with other types of food. That kind of common sense sort of stuff. And if you do that, it's gonna be just fine. Um, so it, with that, I think I'm gonna just answer some questions and if there aren't any questions, I can blab on for as long as you have time for, but uh, are there any questions? Does anybody have any concerns? I know there was uh, some incidents earlier this year. Yes. Right. So the standard doctor uh, answer would be uh, you shouldn't use anything expired. But having said that, if you had nothing else, you should use it. The, uh, they do expire, and the way that the medicines and the expiry dates work is that they take the medication and they put it on a shelf and they come back in intervals depending on, on the company and what drug you're talking about, in this case epinephrine, 
And they'll do that for a certain period of time until they just get done doing it, and then they'll say that's the expiration period. And the FDA will go through that and, uh, and they'll put that on there. So an EpiPen usually will last for 15 months. Uh, depending on which pharmacy you go to, they'll often stack the older ones in the front. So you might get one that only lasts a year or less. But you should get a new one. Right now, there's two different types of, of self-injectable or auto-injector epinephrine. One's called an EpiPen, which is about this long. I should have brought them. I have thousands of them. Um, they're about this long. They have a little blue safety on the back. You take off the safety and you just press it down into the outside muscle of your leg and it will inject a relatively small needle into the muscle on the outside of your leg. And the reason why that's important is that the, that muscle is really big. There's a lot of blood supply to it. And so that's where the epinephrine studies have been done. And it works quicker that way. You could do it in a different muscle, but that's what's recommended. And, uh, and then you put it aside and then you go to the emergency room. If you use an EpiPen or uh, the other epinephrine thing I'm gonna talk about in a second, you have to go to the emergency room because they only last for about 20 minutes. You want somebody there to watch you afterwards. Most of the time, if you use ep almost all the time, if you use epinephrine within 30 minutes of a reaction, you're gonna survive. And the studies that are mostly out of Canada looked at that. And so basically, if you use epinephrine early and you use it you know, appropriately, it's gonna, it's gonna work out just fine, no matter, no matter what the reaction is. For most cases, obviously there's exceptions. The other device, which I don't know if, if I don't know how many people here have these devices, but there's one that's called a uh, AviQ. It's a weird name. It's about this big. It's a little tiny credit card looking thing. It talks to you. You take off the safety and it talks you through it. It's kind of weird, but it, uh, it also works well. And you take off this little red thing and you press it on the same muscle of your leg. And, same kind of deal. But if it's expired, uh, you should get a new one. And because there's now this new device, there's coupons, so they're all free. So, and, and there was a law that was passed. The president just signed a couple of months ago, or maybe even less, that every school uh, is, is to, should have their own EpiPen, just like you'd have uh, other types of rescue stuff. So it's not like you have to have one for every student. And, and I, I, I assume you guys know that. But if you don't, um, every school should have one. So no matter where you're at, if you're at a different school visiting, there should be a, an EpiPen available for general use. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You talk about the allergy rates in the United States. Do you have some figures from other countries as well? I mean, you talked a little bit about the Sure. Well, now that I have time, so I, I can do that, I'll, I will explain. So what happened, we're all born pro-allergic. All human beings are born pro-allergic. And the reason that is, at least the reasons that we think it is, is because when you're born, if you're born, let's say, in the jungle, there's the thing that's going to kill you most quickly is going to be an, a worm infection. And worm infections, or, or, or helminths, is what we think about the most with worm infections, um, need to be killed by the part of your immune system that develops an allergy. And that has to do with this IgE, this antibody E piece, as well as a cell called an eosinophil. So if you are not exposed to worms or endotoxin, which is just an, an animal excrement or other types of infection, early in life, that part of your immune system, which is very powerful in order to destroy worm type infections, which are organisms that live inside humans, that remains. And then it can be, become you know, a, a, an autoimmune-like disease. It, it's, that's what an allergy is. It's a total waste of time. You, don't, you could take IgE, that allergic antibody, out. You can take eosinophils out of people and animals, and they're fine. So it, it's an appendage, uh, and we really don't need it, but we have it. And maybe over hundreds and thousands of years, it'll develop away. But for right now, uh, it's what we have, and it's getting worse. Up until 1870, there was no allergies in human beings, and that's a well-documented fact. And the reason that that changed was because people started putting shoes on and we started to clean our water and we changed the way that we thought about hygiene. And so the hygiene hypothesis, which is pretty well established at this point, uh, is that, and that if you are, the cleaner you live as far as staying away from worm type infections and other types of, of, back, of microbes, et cetera, uh, you will develop allergy. You can make a mouse allergic pretty easily. You can make them unallergic too, but it's a lot harder. And, um, and that's the hygiene hypothesis. So if you go to countries where we don't have a lot of antibiotics and a lot of hygiene, they don't have allergy. They die from other terrible diseases and worm infestations, but they don't have hay fever or food allergy. So that's the hygiene hypothesis, and it's a pretty interesting thing to look, about it, look into if you're, if you're interested in science and how our immune systems work. But, but because of that, so you know, the, first, the first sort of record of hay fever, which is actually ragweed, because ragweed grows in cultivated areas like hay, uh, is in the 1880s in England, and there's a whole, whole interesting story about that. But then you didn't see asthma until the mid-1900s for some of the same reasons. Food allergy really developed when I was 
was developing when I was a kid and now is full on. And you will see what's gone from less than 1% of peanut allergy in the late 70s to now we're way above 1%, heading towards 2%. And I expect by the time you guys get to be my age, it'll be more like 3 or 4%. And the good news is, is that we are looking into and have been very successful in some ways to desensitize people and, and make people less allergic. Um, it's great for allergies, so I'm really not disappointed about it. But uh, we will make it better. And most of the time, allergies don't kill you. And because they don't kill you and there's a huge genetic component to it, uh, you meet other people with allergies and have more people with allergies. So it is a uh, propagating event. As far as other countries go, uh, it really depends on the country and what they're, you know, what they're developed like. The uh, one interesting fact is that the Chinese um, used to boil their peanuts, and boiled peanuts are less allergenic than roasted peanuts, and it has to do with the way the peanut protein is expressed through cooking. Uh, but if somebody, I guess, went to a baseball game and figured out that roasted peanuts are better than boiled peanuts, and now the Chinese are roasting their peanuts, and we're seeing the rate of peanut allergy go crazy in China. And that should continue, because roasted peanuts are better than boiled peanuts. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Well, I think there's some announcements and there are some things that have to happen after me. So I will let you go if there aren't any other questions. Uh, I am a local guy, but uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions from anybody who is around the world. Your parents, if they want to call me, I'm available. Most of this stuff is it's also available all over the place online. But uh, I'm a resource for you. If you need something, feel free to give me a call. Thanks very much.